All right, thank you everyone for the warm welcome. I appreciate it. Um, today I'd like to take a moment to talk about um, as far as hospitals and trauma programs and how we do play the part of a bigger picture and a bigger plan when it comes to emergency preparedness. Um, there was a nice presentation that I actually saw this morning with uh, Dr. Sucre and how he was kind of talking about some of these components. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and just kind of talk about, from a hospital perspective, um, what's required of us from trauma programs and, and just a little bit around that. Uh, we know from, uh, from different types of incidents, whether it's a terrorist attack or anything that's happening within your community, just even reflecting upon 2017 so far to this point with the Las Vegas shooting as well as even the hurricanes that took place in the Gulf, uh, Gulf states, that preparedness is the key to what we do with our programs, but also as a hospital we have a community uh, commitment as a resource. And a lot of those folks within the community look to us as that safe haven place, but also as the experts on how we're going to go ahead and mitigate and manage and take care of people in the time of need. A lot of us are familiar with this particular model, especially if you're running a trauma program. Uh, this is in Chapter 1 of the Orange Book with the ACS. This is the HRSA model. And one of the components as far as trauma system assessment is talking about and reflecting on that emergency preparedness component and how that then ties into with a system plan from a state level, from a county level, and even if, uh, a federal level if, uh, if need be. Here's a couple of the bullet points in regards to uh, Chapter 20 with disaster planning and emergency preparedness. A lot of us that are also gone through any type of ACS site visit are perfectly aware um, that there are requirements in place that we have to meet. We have to participate actively within the emergency preparedness program. Um, as part of that, there should be also a surgeon from the trauma panel that also sits on the disaster preparedness uh, planning committee as well and the emergency preparedness uh, uh, within the hospital. That reports up obviously through your emergency or your uh, EOC with your environmental care committee. Um, and there's some regulatory components around that as well, too, that actually just went into effect as of yesterday with CMS. Um, I'll talk in a moment here about what the disaster exercise that we did here within the Phoenix metropolitan area and kind of tie some of these things in. But um, one of the things, too, as we go through and meeting some of these uh, requirements for participation within the facility, um, we, through our emergency preparedness plan, conduct hazard vulnerability assessments, look at what those hazards are within our facility, but primarily too within our community, and how we would set up an emergency operations plan around that and for a response to any type of an incident that would be taking place. So on a scale standpoint, we do this on a regular basis within our hospitals on a regular, on a regular basis um, and setting up and preparing um, and putting together the emergency operations plans to respond if, if need be. But then how does it start to come together if we have something that's going to be a big incident that does take place? So we start to talk about other types of resources that are out there and how we would kind of tie in and participate and be a part of that. And so knowing who your resources are within the community and knowing who those partners are is, is important. So when we look at, from a, from a high-level standpoint, the first two bullets, fire and EMS and law enforcement, we work with on a regular basis. But to think about then, too, on that level, there's other agencies that are out there that we work closely with. Um, and some of those other agencies happen to be the Office of Emergency Management, that's at the county level as well as the state level. The Department of Health at the county level as well as the state level. Um, Homeland Security, the FBI, the National Disaster Medical System, um, and FEMA. And the big thing is participation is the key. And I think from a program standpoint, as we're involved with it and we know what our, our, our functionality is with it, and we do a lot of this stuff every day within the facility, but also, too, to um, help encourage and then keep driving some of this involvement forward, especially with our administrations within our facilities as well, too, because our response is going to be necessary in order to be that community response and handling and taking care of anything that happens um, within um, that particular area. Emergency uh, preparedness disaster drills and exercises. I wanted to just talk briefly about this from an overview. Um, this is a pretty high level. There's two different types of exercises that are conducted. Um, and we look at these two types as one is a discussion-based exercise, which is a center participation of discussion. And that's in reference to your typical tabletop exercise. Um, the second one's gonna be the operations-based exercise, which focuses on action-oriented activities such as deployment of resources and personnel. Um, so this is gonna be more of your drills or games or your full-scale exercises um, that actually is testing your emergency operations plan to find out where you have any weaknesses 
or gaps and allowing you an opportunity to put together improvement plans around that to improve that and tighten up things as necessary. As I mentioned a moment ago, there were new requirements that went into place as of yesterday with CMS around emergency preparedness. Um, and some of those, um, those new requirements now have looped in your outpatient surgery centers, LTACs, um, and those other smaller facilities where they've never had to deal with what we have on the hospital level with emergency operations planning and those types of things having in place with communications plans, callbacks, in, and those types of things. So that actually went into place yesterday and kind of led up to what we were doing as a region-wide exercise. When you conduct an exercise, you're going to have controllers, evaluators, and also observers. So the controller is going to take the lead in walking through and running your, 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 your incident. Um, and that's going to be working from what's called a master scenario exercise um, agenda, basically, to kind of keep things on point, keep things on track. When you identify what exercise it is you're going to be conducting, you've already outlined what your objectives are going to be and what you want to get out of it, as well as testing your plans. But at that point, once you start doing it, your evaluators are watching, monitoring, monitoring, evaluating, and then at the end we would conduct what would be a call to hot wash and discussing what some of those findings would be, and then an overall debriefing just between the controllers and the evaluators to compile the information and the data to put together a solid after action report, which then drives what we would put in place for an improvement plan uh, back into uh, your emergency operations plan um, for improvements. So what we conducted yesterday was region-wide um, full-scale exercise, um, including all of those other types of facilities that were required to meet the, uh, the, the new requirements with CMS. Um, the Joint Commission also has put out that they are also adopting those same requirements as well, too. Um, so we do have site surveys that are hospitals. Um, they're going to be looking at those things uh, very closely as well. And so yesterday, we had over 100 participating agencies um, facilities um, within a three-county area, covered about five million probably in population estimated. Um, some of the facilities as far as hospitals tested their emergency operations plans in regards to um, with mock victims. The intent of the exercise was to uh, look at the emergency support function for mass care within the county and in the state to handle uh, a large-scale incident and then an influx of patients within the facilities. That put the, uh, the, the facilities in a point to test and look at and activate their incident command center, uh, utilize their hospital incident command system forms to notify, communicate with on duty, off duty, and then consider labor pools as needed um, as staff considerations uh, were necessary. Um, the other thing that we started to find between a couple of our, uh, our sites that we were looking at was quickly when we had some of our uh, individuals that were running the command post within the hospital, they wanted to quickly make a reference to utilizing and transferring patients out, and we're going to call law enforcement or we're going to contact um, fire and EMS. And if something large scale is happening like that, they're not going to be available. So it was a matter of kind of interjecting back in to say, you know, consider what your resources really are because more than likely if it's something large scale and it's going to be on that type of a level, they're not going to probably be available to probably help us out at that point. So that kind of ties back into why um, the DNV as well as the Joint Commission have make it uh, make a point to where we have to have that 96-hour sustainability uh, as a facility uh, on many levels to meet requirements to take care of what we may need to, and that includes your disasters. But we also looked at yesterday and tested our plans around evaluating the infrastructure and utilities and staffing resources, evaluated medical surge within the emergency department and or other units within the receiving, um, such as using any type of mock victims as necessary. Um, and then uh, communicate, share information with response partners such as public health, sister facilities, uh, or corporations, um, out, uh, outreach to neighboring non-hospital health care facilities, um, key vendors as necessary if you have any type of MOUs that, MOUs that were established. Um, one of the things when we set up MOUs is considering any type of additional fuel uh, sources that we may need or generator power if you need to keep running your generators past a certain point. Uh, we look at how, we, how long we, we can run, sustain, and keeping that emergency power up based upon our current uh, fuel levels within our emergency tanks. And then at that point, too, if you're running past that point, then you're teeing things up and activating those uh, memorandums of understanding to get uh, those types of resources in. 
Um, but the other thing, too, is testing the communications, and obviously communication is a key with everything that we do. Um, within the particular region here, we look at and exercise that communications on a regular basis and test what we have in place for our communication systems between hospitals. We're divided up within the Phoenix metropolitan area um, into four uh, sectors under the Arizona uh, Healthcare Coalition for Emergency Response. And we partner together very closely in allocating different types of resources, but also testing our communications back and forth um, and daily updating what we have for availability for practice on a regular basis and logging into our communication systems. Um, we also looked at public messaging and messaging to patients and patient family members. And I know this morning um, uh, Heidi Holtz had, had made a reference to also from a response standpoint when you have an incident where you may have those individuals that may just show up randomly to want to help and participate as volunteers on how you manage those types of people and creating some type of a resource pool around it. And um, that's an important and, and a valid note to consider when you're looking at any type of a mass incident that might be taking place as people are randomly starting to show up. Um, you know, looking back and referencing, you know, many incidents, there are a number of folks that want to go ahead and help and respond. Just like with the hurricanes this year, we had a number of our staff within our system that wanted to go and respond and help out. And so it's a matter of understanding whether there is a, uh, we do have here in the state of Arizona a, 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 a a resource pool that can be asked, requested through FEMA, um, and then those individuals then can be activated and then also then um, deployed to the region or the area to help with the, uh, with the incident or the situation. But it helps us manage resources, and that's the whole key behind it is managing resources effectively. The other thing that we wanted to also test was the patient tracking within the facility, but we also uh, wanted to test the uh, patient tracking from within the region as well, too. Um, that allowed us then to use our electronic system within the region, which is referenced as MTRAC. Um, those individuals then are put into a database. Um, that helps us identify track patients that leave the scene, that arrive at certain facilities, and then we can reunify those individuals with their families. So um, those are things that we consider that we are all working in uh, collaboration with between our uh, facilities, but also that we're working through and uh, also considering on a regular basis within the incident command post within the hospital itself too. So in quick conclusion, I just, uh, as we talked about in the beginning, just kind of setting the over, overall uh, page that we do every, every day with, with uh, meeting ACS requirements um, around emergency preparedness, being involved, uh, participating with the emergency preparedness committees, uh, maintain administrative support uh, from your facility. I think that we can help kind of uh, uh, foster that and uh, also positively reinforce what's necessary, especially from a trauma standpoint, as we are that uh, resource within the community and part of a community response. Um, get involved with your community partners, know who they are, what their roles, responsibilities are, who the agencies are, um, and understand what their, uh, what their uh, commitment is to what they do, and then invite them in and also exercise within your organization as well too, because it's a great learning tool. Um, as we actually, I did uh, three, we're in the process of doing our third active shooter uh, exercise with one, uh, within one of our facilities. So I brought in the, ter the local terrorist liaison officers to talk about what their roles are and responsibilities and how they could play a part is also information sharing. And exercise and train, because obviously, as we know, exercising, training, and drilling uh, makes us proficient in what we do on a daily basis and then continue to share best practices. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>